So as you realize, the example that we saw last time was telling us somewhat that if the flow set and the jump set are the complement of each other, you could have issues with noise. Remember that the jumps were only on this blue line, everywhere else you could flow, and if you have noise, when you get very, very close to the boundary of the flow set, that noise could somewhat tell the logic that you're actually on the other side of the, of the switching surface. And then there was the previous example that was about a purely continuous time system that we ended up with, due to this continuity of the flow map, we ended up with potentially dramatically different solutions without noise and with noise, the one that is a SOTUS type signal. And the noise could be actually very, very small converging to zero. So continuity of the flow map, closeness, or whether flow and jump sets are a complement of each other seem to matter quite a bit. And remember the notion that we define at the end, we define it as a notion that has noise. So this is the definition of a solution to a hybrid system where you, saw, where you have a perturbation E in the state, okay? So I will start today with directly what we call generalized solutions to hybrid systems. This will allow us to quantify precisely the effect of noise. So today will be more on robustness to noise and introduction. to hybrid basic conditions. So what do we mean by a generalized solution to a hybrid system? So in the previous lecture, we saw examples where noise in the state, even if it's small, can lead to different state evolutions. In particular, we have an example that if the state perturbation, remember we call it E, approaches zero, it could be that the nominal behavior or the nominal solution is not recovered. That was identified in the example where we have a discontinuity in the flow map where we argue that for a noise signal that was a square signal, this noise signal here is square the solution that you will obtain in the limit as this epsilon 
parameter will go to zero was a solution that was always constant from zero. And actually, even if the noise size, which was this epsilon, will approach zero, as essentially this i goes to infinity, this approaches zero, then the sequence of behaviors that you obtain approaches the zero solution when you start from zero. So, not necessarily small, but also vanishing. So, even vanishing noise can be problematic. Our goal is to figure out conditions on the data CFDG we do not have different behavior with vanishing noise in the state. That's something that if I could tell you again if I have a continuous time system and you are familiar with the theory of continuous time systems Nonlinear, you will say that the issue that appeared in the example that I showed you in the previous lecture will not appear when the flow map is continuous. And we'll, we'll point to the chapter where that explains later on. For the hybrid case, that's not clear. So that's what we want to characterize. So we're going to define a new, slightly different notion of solution. Uh, we actually going to define two notions of solutions. Okay? And we're going to make connections between them. So the first notion of solution is what we call uh, Hearn solutions. So, so first type of generalized solutions. is what is called Hearn's solutions. So Hermes is a was a researcher that did quite a few um, advances on nonlinear discontinuous systems. Okay. In order to define this we will need to define what is called a closeness or a distance between trajectories to hybrid systems, which we haven't done yet. So the first thing we're going to define is that. This is what is called epsilon closeness um, between hybrid particles. So this is definition 4.11 in the main reference. So if I have two hybrid arcs, I'm given an epsilon. Phi1 and Phi2. We say that Phi1 and Phi2 are epsilon close is the following properties hold. Now, before I write down this, let me put down here a very simple comment or note about distance. Okay? So suppose that 
you're talking about continuous time systems and you're just looking at trajectories over time. So take a function, um, maybe S1 of t, and another function, S2 of t, define for all t greater or equal than 0. How do you define the distance between the signals? What is the natural? Hmm? The norm of what? This could be vectors, right? Take the difference, right? So basically what you have is T and then you have one signal S1 that continues and then you have S2 that continues and then at each T what you do is pick a number T you look at this gap this will be what is called the point-wise distance between S1 and S2. So basically you say that the distance between S1 and S2 at time t, we could define it like this, is some norm of S1 of t minus S2 t. And let's say that as your clear norm. Okay? So this is the point-wise point-wise Euclidean distance between um, S1 and S2. And this is for each t, so this is another function of t. Remember this is, this symbol uh, is what is called maps to and he's telling me that my function goes from t and gives me a value s1 of t. Okay, so if you take a s1 equal to the sine function, you pick a t, the result is the sine at that t value. Okay, so this is obvious, right? Yeah, point wisely. For the hybrid case, we have a little bit of a problem. Can you? see that you don't have data for both signals at that time problematic something along those lines let's draw the trajectory of a timer starting at zero that is reset every time that it hits one so I'm going to do one trajectory right it starts at zero, and then it goes to one. So this is at one, and then it gets reset to zero, and then it gets mapped to one, at j equal one, at zero, right? And then it goes again, and then it gets mapped to two, j, and then again, right? So let's say this is my phi one. Let me now take another hybrid arc and call it phi2. And I will start it a little bit of initial condition away from zero, positive. So it starts there and it flows and then it hits one, right? So this number is one. And then it gets reset to this point and there and then it flows again, and then it gets there. And then it flows again. So that's phi2. OK. 
Okay, if I say that this is delta, this time will be 1 minus delta, right? It gets delta sooner because it starts delta later. So between 0 and 1 minus delta, this distance down here is quite good. Right? I can compare phi 1 t comma 0 and phi 2 t comma 0. What happens in between 1 minus delta and delta? Hmm? Well, phi 1 is, is still evolves from 1 minus delta all the way to delta t, right? But phi 2 did what? Jumped. It jumped. So I can't, I, I don't have a value of phi 2 for j equals 0 and t between 1 minus delta and delta. I need to look for that value for a different j. Okay? Let's say I do that. Let's say I now compare phi 1 at a t between 1 minus delta and delta for j equals 0 and phi 2 for a t between 1 minus delta and delta at j equals 1. What do you see? In other words, I'm comparing, let's say, this value to this value. I'm now flip this a little bit like this, right? Put it, do this in MATLAB and then put that you see only T. Yeah, that's going to be vastly different. Yeah. You get a big jump. Yeah. You see that? Well, why not just interpolate? The areas before, you know, an event could happen, but you know what happens after the event, just interpolate between those two points. What do you mean by interpolate? At some point, I need to tell someone how I need to come up with a distance notion, right? Can you think of the perpendicular distance between those two? The perpendicular distance. Um, it will be like this whole segment, right? <clears throat> But, that, I mean, but what's wrong with having a big jump in the distance? I mean, well, correct. So that's an argument, right? So you see the error. The error is large. So if I look at the point-wise distance, forget about j, whenever I pick a t, I might end up with phi 1 at some j different than phi 2, because one jumped, the other one didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, as you see in this example, we have a big difference. It's almost like 1, right? Yeah? Okay. Is that a problem? Well, notice that no matter how small delta is, this big gap is going to pop up. But what I do believe is that these two trajectories are somewhat close to each other. In other words, if I now, as we did in the previous uh, lecture, if I now pick this initial condition a smaller and a smaller, I make delta go to zero, I will have a sequence of hybrid arcs that will slowly converge to phi1. But no matter which element in the sequence I pick, I will have this big gap. So what happens down here, even though probably it's not obvious, but if this S1 and S2 will be solutions to a continuous time system with continuous flow map. As you make these initial conditions match or converge to each other, these trajectories will converge to each other, and the distance will converge to zero. But as you see for this case, as the distance or as the initial condition gets close to each other, the distance still is very large. The only time it will be zero is when you start there. So that generates a little problem about saying that sequence of trajectories converge according to a distance. 
What is the solution? Well, what is that is somewhat close in this picture? The jumps, the location of jumps. Right. So if I now can allow myself not to look at the same t, I will be probably OK. In other words, if I now go here and slice this at j equal 0, which is this one, then these two segments are close. How close? Delta close. Right? But now I need to compare this point to this point, which have different t. One is t equal 1, the other one is t equal 1 minus delta. And that's what the epsilon closeness gives us. It allows us to compare on slices of j and do not insist on t's being the same. Because the bottom line here that you notice but you didn't say it, is that the hybrid time domains of these two hybrid arcs are not the same. And that's the problem. But in the limit as delta goes to zero, the hybrid arcs do end up having the same uh, time domains. So you don't want to look at windows where they are, the behavior is similar. You want to look at the slices of these for j's equal for both. Okay, so let me write this down. So uh, given epsilon and 200 arcs, we're going to say that these guys are close if we have the following. For all t comma j in the domain of phi1, there exists an s such that s comma j, same j in the domain of phi2, with the property that t minus s is less than epsilon, and the arcs for, this, for the same j, but different ordinary time, are less than epsilon. This is for every element in the domain of phi1. Conversely, for every element in the domain of phi2, there exists also an S such that S with the same J is in phi1. And the t's, meaning t minus s is a small, or epsilon, and then the values are epsilon y. Okay, so I could try to reproduce it here. But this um, this is doing a better job for us. So this is these are two arbitrary um, arcs. <clears throat> So you have one, phi1 one in the solid dark, and then phi2 in the solid lighter. And what this is saying is that if you put around phi1 a ball of size epsilon, so for instance for this j equals zero, you are containing phi2. So you contain all those values of phi2. And the same when you do that for phi2, you contain the values of phi1. So the times are not shown here, so this guy that comes out here could still satisfy the definition. But just focus on the j equal to 0 
where you can see that these contain each other, balls contain to each other. So with this notion of distance, now we can introduce what we say would be a solution in this, this sense, the sense of terms. So we go back to a hybrid system with the perturbation. We call it HE. HE is right here. So for this hybrid system, HE. So given a hybrid system with a state perturbation E, namely HE, a compact hybrid arc phi is a compact Hermes solution to H if there exists a sequence of solutions and a sequence of perturbations such that the following holds So phi i is a solution to H e with perturbation e i for every i. For every epsilon larger than zero, there exists a number i zero such that for all i's larger than i zero, phi i and phi are epsilon plus. And then the sequence of values converges.
Okay. So what we're going to define here, which we really wrote, is um, so definition. So this is harm. solution to H, which is defining via solutions to HE. Okay, so before we walk through this, what we define on Tuesday was let's grab our not perturb system H and let's add E right so this is the new stuff just this right so we added this 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 and this and then we say we know what a solution without noise is what do we mean by a solution with noise okay I need a signal which is an exogenous signal so V N the exogenous signal, which we call it the admissible perturbation, will define a solution to the perturbed system if the initial condition, which is now perturbed, is where we expect, if the evolution of the state with the noise added during flows is what we expect, and that jumps is what we expect. And we argue that in the domains of these two pairs so these two elements that define a pair, V and E, are not the same, this could be a little problem. So we added that there. And that's what we can do. So now we have the notion of solutions with noise. We want to capture solutions with noise that converge to zero. Yeah. Um, just just gonna define the sequence of values, the smallest upper bound uh, on the length of the value that converges to zero. Yes, yeah, so I'm gonna walk through this, okay? Okay, so how do we now define a solution H in this sense, in the sense of Hermes? A solution to H in this sense is, in simple terms, is the limit that you will obtain of the solutions that have noise when the noise goes to zero. Okay, so go back to the example that we did um, Again, we did on Tuesday, and we say, if I apply this noise, I always get this funny solution. But if now I make this noise size go to zero, so epsilon will go to zero, then I end up with the zero solution. So that zero solution is the solution in the sense of terms. So how do we define it? Okay, we start with a compact hybrid arc, okay? Compact hybrid arc is what? Anyone remembers? It's a hybrid arc that has? Bounded. Bounded what? It's on the domain, right? The properties on the domain, not on the values. A compact hybrid arc is a hybrid arc whose hybrid time domain is a compact set. Mm -hmm. Okay? So it's a so you can you can draw the hybrid arc and then what is defined is a closed set and bounded. Okay? So we start with bounded T's and J's because of the notion is requiring these into steps, but again it could be simplified a little bit. But in any case. We say that this compact hybrid arc phi is a compact Herm solution. If there exists a sequence of solutions to the noise problem, so phi i's and e i's are solutions to the noise problem, such that the phi i's, after some number of i's, so in your sequence, you look at the tail of that sequence, the phi i's and the phi have this closeness in the sense of their slices by j. Okay? And moreover, the noise size converges to zero. 
Okay, so this is capturing vanishing noise. And this is saying that the tail of the sequence phi i <coughs> is close to phi. And that defines a compact Herm's solution. Now, what is a Herm's solution? Well, is a solution that every time that you restrict it to a compact hybrid time domain, you obtain a compact Hermes. So the same two steps definition we use for define a hybrid time domain. Remember, we define a compact hybrid time domain, and then we define a hybrid time domain. The same structure is here. So how does this help us? Well, bear with me. So you have noise in the system. You define solutions with noise, and now the noise goes to zero. The question is, where do the solutions go? That's the Herm solution. Okay. Well, Questions? Why would noise disappear? It's not that we want it to disappear. It's that we would like to know. Remember the point that I started here. That because of um, the issues that we mentioned on Tuesday, you might have that very, very small noise generate very dramatic different behavior even when the noise goes to zero. So we would like to know what are the conditions that prevent that from happening. Okay? So looking a little bit ahead, let me say the following and see if you follow. If I have a small noise, vanishing noise, I have these new solutions, right? Again, back to this example. I have these new solutions. What are the conditions in my system such that all these new solutions will be already be seen without noise. In other words, to the point that when noise kicks in and the noise vanishes, nothing is going to change. If I would have such conditions, I would be able to design my system to satisfy that, those conditions, and then I would be able to say, I don't care if noise kicks in, as long as the noise converges to zero, nothing is going to change. Okay? All right. So now let's define the second notion of solution. So this somewhat makes sense. We'll come back to this. So second type of generalized solution. Second type of the generalized solution is what is called Krasovsky. So it's a double I. What is the restriction on phi that's happening on the definition from the solution? So you grab your phi mm -hmm. and then you it, it might be that it's not a compact okay. hybrid arc you constrain it by any set okay. to get a compact. Okay. And then you can apply the definition in blue. Okay. So let me now define Krasovsky solution. So the idea is that, again, we're going to define it for the um, system H. And this one now is going to not be via HE, it's going to be via what we call convexified data. So we will have the following definition. A hybrid arc phi is Krasovsky solution to H, which has data given 
by the usual objects if phi is a solution to the regularized hybrid system given by the following system. So we're going to call this h hat and its data, as you realize here, is c hat, f hat, b hat, g hat. The way we're going to construct this new system, in other words, these new sets and maps, is as follows. So C hat is going to be nothing but the closed version of C. Okay. D hat is not going to be more than the closed version of D. And F hat and G hat is where we're going to do this, what I call convexification. I'm going to write it and then explain. So what is going on here? Well, the easy part is the following. Give me a system, C, F, D, and G. I would say that this phi is a Krasovsky solution to that system if it is a solution to the following system in the standard notion, right? This will be in the sense of definition I believe is 2.5 2.6 so we have the notion you already know it you exercise it the question is what is this system where is this system coming from okay. so the easy part is c hat and d hat right you have your c you build c hat by closing it. Okay? So we go to this example. That's my C. Is everything but the line. When I close it, what do I get? There's no G anymore. You mean the gap? The gap. Well, I got, I got C. C is everything but the line. What do I obtain when I close C? Hmm? Just the line. No, no, no. 
the clause C is C plus its boundary, right? So what do I obtain? Line. Or the boundary C, line. C and line. Everything. So C bar here will be R2. R2, right? Yeah? Are you with me? You have a set, you close it, you grab the set plus the boundary. So this is C everything but the line. The boundary is the line. C bar will be everything. Okay, so that's my C bar. What is D bar? Uh, D hat is the closed. Same story. In this case, nothing will change, right? D hat will be equal to D because D is already closed. It's a line of points. It's its own boundary. Perfect. So that's the easy ones. What's going on here? Well, let me say first that this is what you have due to the potential discontinuity of F and G. Okay, so let me walk through this. So this is saying, give me an X, I would like to define my F hat, my new flow map. How this is going to be defined? Okay, I'm going to pick deltas. Let's say I pick one delta, delta equal to one to start, but any delta that is positive is going to be used here. It's a process that you need to do for all possible deltas. But let's say you pick one, delta equal to one. Okay, so x is fixed, right? It's the value at which I want to figure out what this f hat is. So I go in here and I put a neighborhood around x of size one, which is my delta. Okay. Now I intersected with C because my F to start from maybe only is defined in C, which is where I flow. So that's not more than making sure that I evaluate this F in the right area. So I got F on a neighborhood. And we're gonna do an example in a few minutes. Okay? On a neighborhood of X. Okay? If F is a constant, I get a constant. If f have a bunch of directions on the neighborhood, I get all those directions. I get a collection of vectors. Okay. What I do now is to take what is called the convex hull. This operation here is the convex hull of a set of vectors. What is the convex hull of two vectors, like this? It's the convex combination of all vectors. I get this vector, I get this vector, and I get all the vectors in between. Okay? Make sense? What is the convex hull of two points, one and minus one? One, minus one, and the whole uh, set of elements in between. I get an interval between one and minus one. So that's what is going on here. Okay? And then what I do is I a sweep for all deltas. And whatever result I have, I intersect it. So what is this saying? This is essentially allowing us to do the following. Take our discontinuous um, flow map example. So this is the example we did on Tuesday. This was a discontinuous flow map example, right? If x2 is larger or equal than 0, we get 1, 0. If x2 is less than 0, we get minus 1 and 0. Okay? So if I pick a point that is right here, like this point, okay, and I put balls of size delta, every time I pick a delta, if it is very large, I will be picking some vector that is blue, but since I need to pick all possible deltas with any positive size, I will need to necessarily pick very small deltas, and when I intersect what I obtain, I will always obtain just the red vector. When I'm on the top part, away from the axis, I'll have the same situation. This is saying that where the flow map is continuous, this intersection with the convex hull doesn't change. But if I now pick a point on this boundary, let's say I pick this point, no matter how small delta is around it, I will always pick a vector f in that direction and a vector f in this direction. No matter how small delta is, right? Do you see that? 
And then when I take the convex hull of that, what I'm going to obtain is all possible vectors that I have by convex making the convexification between this vector and this vector. And that's everything that is on that line. So at this very point of z2 equal to 0, I will obtain here the convex hull between 1, 0 and minus 1, 0, which will be no more than for the first component between minus 1 and 1, for the second component equal to 0. So what this is doing, this operation is doing, which is, again, initially somewhat intimidating, is no more than collecting the directions where you have these continuities and putting them in a convex set. So, bottom line, if my f is a single value map, as many of your examples, and is continuous, this operation does nothing. If my g is single value map and continuous, this operation does nothing. The point is when these functions are not continuous. Because as we saw, the noise can make you essentially chatter around this continuity. Okay? With me? You go back to that example. Yeah. Uh, then what that's saying is you pick either the vector, uh, the blue vector or the red vector. Uh, what is the uh, example? Okay. Yeah. Um, so what that is saying is you're picking either the blue vector or the red vector. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So if you pick this point, so again, you need to compute this f hat everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. When you pick a point in the boundary, and now you look at the directions that you have around that delta size, no matter how small the delta is, it has to be larger than zero, mm -hmm. you will always have a blue vector or a red vector. Because the intersection will give you that. Because the intersection will give you that. Okay. And what, what is the alpha? What's the, what's the right next to delta? A delta B? Yeah. That's the intersection. Oh, uh, no, no. No, no it's the beta. In x plus, in f of x plus uh, delta beta. That one? Or oh, delta ball. <coughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Yes. So this is a ball. This is a closed ball of radius delta. So the difference for the gem map is that we don't do the convexification. And actually, let me just explain also. This is the closed convex hole because it has a bar on top. That bar is closing it. Um, and this is just closing the values. So let, let's write these things down and just give you a couple of examples before we take the break. So um, so C hat and D hat are nothing but C plus the boundary of C and D plus the boundary of D, not C. That's the boundary. Okay. This is the partial notation. So that's C bar and that's D bar. And that can be computed pretty easily. However, as you already probably thought about, if you do that for this example, then you generate more solutions, right? Now you have non-unique solutions at the origin. At the origin, you have the solution that keeps flowing forever because flow set now is everything. And you also have a solution that jumps. And we'll come back to that, why that makes sense. So doing this, you add points, you're potentially adding more solutions to your system. But there is a benefit on doing that. 
So f hat is the convexification of f, meaning um, peak x build a ball around x of size delta. This is what x plus delta ball is. Okay. Now what you need to do is um, an intersected by c. So that so that f is assured to be defined. Then what you do is to evaluate f at x plus delta ball intersected with c, and then you take the convex hull of the resulting vectors and close it. This operation needs to be done for every delta larger than zero and every result in here intersected for all that. Okay, so you compute, intersect, you compute, intersect until you get the resulting thing. So an example for this would be, so back to example 14, F tilde is this continuous at C2 equal to C. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, we pick um, a point, uh, let's call it C2A at C2 equal to zero, C2B at um, What am I doing here? Um, sorry, ZA CB and then CC. So let's do samples. So this is C2. So this CA is um, 0 for C2 and let's say 1 for C1. This guy, let's say, is uh, 0.84 Z1 and minus 1 for Z2. And then this guy is, let's say, 0.9 for Z1 and 1 for Z2. Okay. So the idea is that now I need to build delta. So let's do the, um, the Z8 first. So I pick a delta. And now I compute my f. So my f in this delta, I will have all vectors on the top that are pointing in that direction. So these are the vectors 1, 0. And at every point on the top, right? And on the bottom, we'll have all vectors that are pointing in this direction, minus 1, 0. So then from this computation, what I have is for this case, so for CA, I have the intersection of all delta larger than zero of the convex hull between one zero and minus one zero. That will be my F at the point CA with a hat, right? So this is what we 
define as my f tilde, that was the initial function, right, of um, z plus delta ball intersected with c. That's my f tilde. And what is this function at this value? Well, no matter what the delta is, because it's always positive, I, always, I will keep picking 1, 0, minus 1, 0. So then this, will, this guy will be just the convex hull of 1, 0, minus 1, 0. And because the second component is always 0, this is no more than correct, minus 1, 1. That's the result of the convex hull in 0. So now this is set value, right? The velocity for the Z1 component can be any point between minus 1 and 1. In particular, it could be 0, right? And remember that example, we argued that you could get stuck on the axis and not move. So that's the resulting vector. Um, for ZB, Now, sure, I can start with very large deltas. So let's say for this delta, I do pick up minus one zero vectors, but since I need to do it for all deltas, I will eventually realize that deltas small makes sense here only. And when you do those deltas small, then I will only pick up these vectors the one series. So for CV, uh, we end up with F hat at CV equal to always one zero. And for C, C, I also have the same. So the bottom line is that where f is continuous, right? So the idea here will be if f is continuous at x, then f hat of x is equal to f of x. Because what is a continuity property? Well, if it is continuous at a point x, there exists a delta such that for every x prime that is delta close to x, f at x and f at x prime are not too different. So therefore, that buys automatically that you don't have a jump because that's the definition of continuity. And you can see that that delta will actually, will need to be chosen small enough to make that work. So that's the message um, that you take. Okay. Okay, and the jump map is the same. So the jump map is the same. So is the closure, we don't do the complexification, is the closure of G. So maybe instead of saying via convexified, I would say via but close plus convexified, because the sets get closed and the G gets only closed. Okay. Okay. So let's say that we understand how to build these things. And again, it's just a technical um, step. What is the main message? And we'll take a break and then do an example. But this is the main point of today. So... Suppose that f 
and G are bounded. Local is enough. Okay. Then a hybrid arc phi is a Herms solution to H if and only if it is a Krasovsky solution to H. So what is this saying? This is saying that if I have a hybrid arc phi that is the limit as i goes to infinity of a sequence of phi i's generated with vanishing the eyes then it is a solution to the regularized system And what is the key point here for us? So take your favorite H, right? Grab the one from your project, okay? Now, regularize it. namely compute c hat f hat d hat g hat okay simple technical operations if c hat f hat d hat g hat is equal to C F D G then every new solution that vanishing noise generate is already captured by your mouth why is this important if you design your algorithm so that the closed loop system or you design your model so that the resulting system has the same data than the regularized version of it then if you prove that there is a set that is asymptotically stable a small noise will not change that remember the example we didn't write down but I mentioned it to you this simple example example 4.9 is an example where you flow when you are less or equal than one and you jump otherwise. Nominally, every solution converges to zero and zero is stable. In other words, this set 
the origin is globally asymptotically stable, but a small noise when you are nearby one will prevent solutions from converging. If you were to have that, which is not the case in this problem, if you were to have that the data of this system satisfies the property I just wrote that is equal to the regularized data, then you will have a problem. So the message is, start with your model, regularize it, and then work with that model. If that regularization adds solutions to your system that you don't think are appropriate, then you need to model it differently. Okay? Regularizing is just adding, adding noise? Is that what you mean by regularizing? By regularizing, I mean this. Regularize it, namely compute the new elements, C hat, F hat, D hat, G hat. And the way we compute that is using the construction given in this definition. But again, the message is that if your system has single value flow map and is continuous, single value jump map and is continuous, and flow and jump sets that are close, you can go home because there's nothing to do, right? It's for free. The problem is when you have set value tests in the maps or discontinuity in the maps. So for instance, the example that you um, worked out at some point, this manipulator hitting the wall, right? There was a discontinuity there. There was a contact force that was going from being zero to being some function of the damping and friction coefficients. That's a discontinuity. It turns out that you can regularize that system and prove there is no solution added to your system. So even though you started with a system that doesn't have the property that is regularized is the same as the original, when you regularize, you don't add solutions. So you just work with a regularized system, which not, that doesn't change anything. Okay. But when we come back, and we should do that right now, otherwise you will um, not grasp all the ideas. So let's take five minutes of break, 7.25. What we need to now understand is, in the previous examples, how are these things popping up? And it's pretty evident what's going to happen. Okay.